This message is one of the Times Square Church pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindell, Texas, 75771, or calling 903-963-8626. You are welcome to make additional cassettes of this message for free distribution to friends. However, for all other forms of reproduction or electronic transmission, existing copyright laws apply. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 10th chapter. 1 Corinthians 10th chapter. Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall is my subject. Let's read the first 12 verses, chapter 10, 1 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you... That you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things that they also lusted. Need to be idolaters as some of them were. And by the way, in the original, that's three, as most of them were. Need to be idolaters as were most of them, as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed as serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Father, let the Holy Ghost come upon these words. Lord, this is dead letter without the Spirit. And I pray, Lord, you come upon me with sanctifying power, preaching authority, and let Christ's name be glorified in the Word today. We love you, Jesus, and thank you for your presence in this house. But now, Lord, we, we come to be fed by the hand of God. Manna from heaven, O oh God, speak to us all this day in every service. Amen. Now, Paul is speaking to brethren. He's speaking to the church of Jesus Christ. I believe he's speaking to the Corinthian church primarily, but he's speaking to the church in general, all generations to follow, and he's speaking to me especially. And he says, brethren, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Beware, brethren, lest you take a fall. Now, now is Paul... Speaking about believers who were going to fall into deep lust, the kind of lust and sins they had been delivered from by the hand of Christ. Is, is he worried that he himself, uh, because he, he makes a statement in the previous chapter about keeping his body under authority and into subjection. It, is he worried about a fall into some kind of lust or immorality? God forbid, that's not what this is about. That's not what this chapter is speaking about. There is a fall here mentioned. But let me tell you what it is in just a moment. In 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, in verse 27, he said, I keep under my body, and I bring it under subjection, that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And in the context, he's speaking about a race. And he, he said, you... You have to be under control in this race. Your, your body has to be under subjection. And he, he says, I keep under my body and I bring it under subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He said, I could not finish this race. I can't finish this race. And I, he identifies himself as a boxer in this last verse. And he said, I, I don't fight the air. He said, I make it count. I come again my, against my doubts and my unbelief. And I have to land a devastating blow on all of my doubts and fears. Or I will be disqualified from this race. 
in, in, when he speaks about uh, being a castaway means be disqualified. And what he's saying, after all my preaching on faith, and I've been encouraging others to finish the race, run a good race, fight a good fight. And he said, after all my preaching, if I am involved in this particular sin that I want to talk to you about in the service this afternoon or this morning, he, he said, if if I don't bring my body under subjection on this matter, if I allow this particular sin to go unbeaten, unchallenged, then I'm going to be disqualified myself from this race. And what he's saying, if God disqualified the whole uh, Israelite dispensation, if he disqualified them because of this particular sin, will he not disqualify me for the same sin? Let us lay aside. You can't understand what he's saying unless you get it from Hebrews 12.1. Let us lay aside every weight, the sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He said there's a sin that so easily besets us, that's common to all of us. And he said this is the one sin that I fear above all. It's the mother of all sins. It's the root of all evil. And he said, this is one sin common to the body of Jesus Christ. And he said, I'll not have you ignorant of it. I'm I'm not going to let go unchallenged. I've challenged it in my own life, and I'm going to challenge it in the church now. This is the sin of unbelief. This is the fall that is mentioned in this chapter. Paul is thinking about all of his past preaching. Now, he's a preacher of faith. This man preached faith. This is the man that said, for by faith you stand. He's the preacher who said, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. He said, the just shall live by faith. He preached that we live by faith, we're justified by faith, we're kept by faith, we overcome by faith, we claim the promises by faith, we fight the good fight of faith. It was faith, 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 all through Paul's preaching. And he said, in light of what I've preached... In light of what I have told people to do, to believe and trust God, if now in this race I give in to doubt, I give in to fear, and I give in to unbelief, I will be disqualified. I will not finish the course. I cannot finish the race because I will be disqualified. And he's saying, God, I'm showing you an example from our fathers how they were totally disqualified and how they were left to waste away in the desert. In a wilderness because of unbelief. The sin that is common to all of us. The sin that is one of the most dangerous of all. And the root of all other sins that would follow. In light of this, he said, I fight and I don't beat the air. He said, I have got to give a devastating blow to all unbelief in my life. If I'm to be able to finish the course and win the race. Now, in chapter 10, here in 1 Corinthians, Paul shows the possibility of enlightened Christians to fall into a state of unbelief. It's possible for the most enlightened Christians, the most privileged Christians, the most blessed believers to fall into this terrible sin. And he says, I'm going to take you back into the Old Testament. He said, I'm going to show you the example. I'm going to show you. The danger of unbelief. He said, I want you, I don't want you to be ignorant of what happened to your fathers. The fathers were those in Israel, our spiritual fathers, those who, who were called out of Egypt past the Red Sea. And he begins to enumerate the privileges of these people. He said, now let me tell you about your fathers. He said, all our fathers were under the cloud and they passed through the sea. Now, the Bible said the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and led them in the way and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light. Now, this speaks of God's guidance. It speaks of his protection. And Paul was saying, I want you to know that your fathers were divinely, supernaturally led by the Spirit of God. These were men who had God's hand upon them. They, they, all of them, were under this protective cloud. They all passed through the sea. 
They were privy to miracles, one miracle after another, but the greatest miracle ever recorded, perhaps, an actual miracle, that the seas should pile up under an east wind, and they could go over on dry ground. The east wind would dry up ground so their wagons wouldn't uh, sog down in the mud. And he said, think of the privilege of these men. They could talk the rest of their life. They had a testimony. They all passed through the sea. They all knew Miracle power in their lives. They could talk about it and testify to their children and their grandchildren. I was there. I saw what God did. They were all baptized into Moses. That means that they were, they were submitted unto the truth and the gospel preached by this meek man. In other words, they were well taught. They were not ignorant concerning the ways of God, the nature of God, the attributes of God. These men... These Israelites were well trained. They sat under a powerful gospel such as no other nation on earth could hear or understand. Baptized with truth by the hand of Moses. They sat under a man who was a prophet, a man of prayer, a man of holiness, a man who came from God's presence and stood before them and gave them the word of the living God. All ate the same spiritual meat. They all drank the same spiritual drink. This was the man and the water that came out of the rock. And the Apostle Paul said that rock is Christ. In other words, that rock represents Christ. Christ was in the Father at the time. And he says, this is, this represents. And not only that, it represented the water and the bread represented the communion. He said, here are people. Think of their, uh, of the, Uh, blessings and the privileges. They are saved out of Egypt. They've had a genuine conversion. They are led by the Holy Spirit. They've been baptized in and through the waters. They have sat under great preaching. And they know what communion is. They've heard the very voice of God. No people ever sat under greater teaching. This man was a prophet. He came from God. He said, in spite of these privileges, in spite of everything that I gave them, but with many or most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. In other words, they took a fall into unbelief. With whom was he grieved forty years? To whom swore thee that they should not enter into the rest? But to them that believed not, some So you see, they could not enter in because of unbelief. I was grieved with that generation. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. And he said, I will hide my face from them. These are a children in whom is no faith. He said, there's no faith. I have given them every privilege. I've shown them miracles. And, And every ensuing crisis, even though I met them, I would meet them and for a season they would rejoice, they would glorify my name, say, I serve a great deliverer, and then a few days later in the next crisis they're saying, God, where are you? Paul reminds the believers, now these things were our examples. These things, this is verse 6 and verse 11, happened unto them for examples. They're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. He says, now you take heed. And he said, now let's talk about your privileges. He said, beware, New Testament believers, lest you fall into the same example of unbelief. He said, you have even greater privileges. You don't have an essence of Christ. You don't have a shadow of Christ. You don't have a type of Christ. You have the Christ. You have been in his presence. You have tasted of Christ. You have sat under a gospel, not of the letter, but of demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost, as Paul said. You had covenant revealed to you. You've had a manifested Christ. You've been filled with the Holy Ghost and you've been given all the gifts of the Holy Ghost. You've had signs and wonders in the working of miracles. 
You've had better promises. You've heard incredible preaching. And you have a revelation of a high priestly glory interceding for you. And you have an Old Testament, a completed canon of the Old Testament. You have the prophets. And you have all of these truths. And you have the epistles. You have the writings of these great men of God. You have all of these privileges. You have been at the communion table and you know what it represents. You have been so blessed. You've been so privileged. And then he comes and says, there remains a rest of the people of God. He's saying, Israel rejected it. They wouldn't enter in because of unbelief. They allowed their doubts and their fears to overwhelm them. They turned to idols. And he said, there still remains a rest to the people of God. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Now listen to this. They're talking about a fall. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Take heed lest you fall. What are we talking about? Adultery, fornication, homosexuality, drugs, alcohol. We're talking, those are all grievous sins and all the result of this sin. We're talking about unbelief. Lest you fall into a spirit of unbelief. And lest you fall, you, you, that is a fall in the sight of God. It's a fall into mire and degradation. More than any sin named on the face of the earth. No other sin does God hate more than unbelief. Because it's the root sin of all the others. Yet Paul tells them they're in danger of falling. At the peak of their blessings. At the very pinnacle of, of all that they have been taught. And now they sit comfortably in the Corinthian church. And they can look at one another. And, and there is, there had to be some sense of maturity in that house. There had to be those who were pillars. And he comes to these who were pillars. He comes to the pastors. He comes to all of us. As he comes to me and you today. And he said, beware. Watch out. Take heed. Lest you fall into the same sin that disqualified Israel. That left them wasting in the desert in spite of all of their privileges and a God who loved them. And a God who took them in his loving arms. He said, now you beware. Lest you fall into this state of unbelief. And you be disqualified. And you do not finish the race. Let, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And God abhorred Israel for it. He turned his face from Israel because of it. He gave Israel over to their sins because of it. Now he says, take heed lest you fall into the same example of unbelief. Now that brings us to our day. That brings us to Times Square Church. It brings it home to me now as a pastor. He says, you Church of Jesus Christ of the last day. Those of you hearing me now, the most privileged of every generation in the past, of any generation. We are so far more privileged than the church at Corinth. We now have the whole canon of Scripture here in our hands. We have not only the testimony or the example of the Old Testament, we now have the example of the Corinthians themselves. Not only that, we have a we have a, a media saturation of the gospel that the Corinthians could have never even conceived of. We have preaching on television, our own churches on radio preaching a gospel. Some of the sermons that you hear, the messages that you hear are being heralded all over across the city. And, and you can pick up magazines, you can pick up books, and there's mass publication, mass media. And what do you do when you pick up a really genuine Christian magazine or you hear a genuine preacher of the gospel, someone truly filled with the Spirit? You hear testimonies. 
You hear of people being healed. You hear of people that have been healed of cancer. You hear of people who face death without fear. You hear miracle after miracle after miracle of God's faithfulness. No other generation has been so saturated with the blessings and the testimonies of the utter faithfulness of God. In spite of this, we have a generation falling in the church into unbelief. And if God disqualified Israel for unbelief, will He not disqualify us who are the most privileged people on the face of the earth? Paul goes further and deeper into the horror of unbelief. He warns, he said, now let me show you where all this ends. Let me show you where unbelief takes you. Let me show the end result of unbelief in the heart of a believer. He said there's a gravity to sin, to unbelief. There's a pull, a gravity. He said a gravity that will pull you down into the flesh. And you will commit sins that you never conceived possible in your life. No matter how long you've walked with God, no matter how many privileges you've had. And Paul was speaking to privileged Christians. He's speaking to brethren, full of the Holy Ghost, baptized in water, sitting under the Word of God, having heard all the testimonies, having a full canon of close Scripture. And in spite of all of that, he says, take heed. Because Paul said, I'm going to show you now where it ends. I'll show you where it takes you, where unbelief is going to take you. Now, these things were examples that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. You see, Paul saying, when our fathers began to disbelieve God, when they fell into this horrible sin of unbelief, lust broke out in the flesh. And he names idolatry and fornication. Neither be your idolaters as they Neither commit fornication as some of them committed, and in one day 23,000 fell. Yet, now you see, all of these sins are very grievous that we're talking about the sins of the flesh, the lust of the flesh. But you see, God didn't name those things when He, he spoke about Israel not entering into the rest and how He abhorred Israel because of what? Unbelief. He, he does not name these other, He didn't even name idolatry. He, because those were all the fruit of this root of unbelief. What is unbelief? <clears throat> Simply put, unbelief is to doubt God is faithful to His Word. Unbelief is to doubt God is faithful to His Word in two ways. It is doubt that God will keep His promise to deliver us in impossible situations. When we face an impossible situation, impossible trial, it's this growing fear, though I have seen God do this before, will He do it now? Can I utterly, utterly believe Him? Can I live a life of faith where no matter whatever comes my way, I can trust? And then see, unbelief breaks out in not believing that God would be faithful to back up His commandments with divine judgment. Not believing that God has any wrath. And all we hear today in churches all over the world is the love of God. You never hear of hell. You never hear of reproof. Now, different in this church, I can assure you. But you see, the Bible says, they tempted Christ. Neither let us, verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. How did they tempt Christ? He was in the Father. And the Bible says they tempted Christ. Now, here's how they tempted him. First of all, they tempted him with what I would call provisional faith. 
They tempted him by saying, yes, God, I, I know what you have done in the past for me. Yes, I can enumerate many miracles. How you've touched me, you've delivered me. But now, God, I'm asking you, you've got to do it one more time. If you'll do it one more time, you see, it's a provision. I, 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 make, I, I lift the bar every time we keep lifting the bar. Lord, if you do this one more time, I'll never doubt you again. Israel said that ten times. And when it says tempt God in the original, it says tempted beyond endurance. The root word suggests endurance. God said, you trade my patience beyond endurance. You're putting me to the test. You're tempting me to see if I'm going to be faithful. You won't take me at my word. You want another miracle. Lord, one more time. God said, no, that's tempting me. We tempt Christ's mercy because of unbelief. I consider the most tragic, this most tragic, dangerous fruit of unbelief. If I do not fully believe that God will keep his word and judge transgression in my life, I'm going to see how far I can go. I'm going to keep taking God to the brink. This means that a man will, can be in his home and he's got a cable TV. And suddenly there is uh, pornography right in his face. He takes two minutes and the Spirit of God says, shut it down. Cut it off. And he cuts it off and there's a tinge of, of conviction. There's a godly sorrow. He says, oh God, forgive me. But then you see the devil keeps coming and says, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not that big of a deal. Fifteen minutes. And so he goes and he turns it on again. And see, now he's tempting the mercy of God. Because, you see, God didn't judge him. And, folks, you've got to go back to the, the seduction of Moab in Israel, against Israel. How Balak was taught by Balaam to seduce Israel. And the Bible says very clearly, and... and uh, let me, let me read it to you. The people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And Vedic was taught, he said, ease them into it. Bring them to a dinner. They brought them first to a dinner. They invited all the men of Israel that would come to a great dinner. They had their false gods and they slowly introduced it. Now, they come home from this dinner. And there's no judgment. They wait one day, probably wait a week, and there's no judgment. I mean, nobody dies. There's no disease. They're, they're not getting a cancer or tumor, and they're not dying. Mercy of God. And so they're invited back, and this time to a dance. And, and this time, they go home from the dance, and lust is growing. You see, there's a gravity to unbelief. And it pulls you deeper and deeper into sin. You see, if a man jumps off a fifth-story uh, thing, which is most dangerous, the first step or the last? If a man is falling, he takes first step. You say, he's dead. He's gone because gravity is going to take him right to his death. And you see, this, this is how it worked with Israel. And so they go back. And about the third trip, these men are now committing fornication with these more by these women. And it's tempting Christ to see how far we can go before God will judge it. And because judgment, the scripture said, is God is not quick to judge sin because of judge quickly. Men are encouraged in their sins. Tempting Christ. Because if you're going to tempt him on his faithfulness to meet your need, and to do the impossible. If you're going to doubt him. In spiritual matters you're going to doubt him. Everything having to do with your flesh. You're going to doubt him in his keeping power to keep you from the lust of the flesh. You're going to doubt every promise there is in the covenant. You're going to doubt it. Because unbelief spreads through every area of our life. 
And even while Moses is slaying those who are committing this sin, he was hanging their heads up on poles so everybody could see it. And here's how far down you can go to unbelief. There's a man who brings a Moabitish woman into his tent right in the face of Moses, right before the holy man of God. And that's how sin, you can gravitate and get down so low until it's not only a fall into unbelief, but it's a fall into the fleshly mire of hell. Now, let me tell you what I believe. And I've written this down. I'm just going to read it to you. This is what I believe. I believe that when Christ forgave me and redeemed me, he gave me his Holy Spirit. And my body became the temple. And he lives here. He abides here. He's in his temple. And he is here to renew my mind and my will. The will that fell in the garden was restored when the Holy Ghost possessed me. My will was renewed. So I now, because I have the Holy Ghost in me, because Christ abides in me, I have the will and the power to obey the Holy Spirit's urgings. And I believe that in Christ I have the power to resist temptation. I believe that the first look at sin, the Holy Ghost will come and say, stop, go no further. I believe that I have the power to obey that Spirit's voice. I believe that if I disobey that voice of the Spirit, I open myself to demon seduction. I believe that if I reason with my lust, if I say it's not that bad, then I'm in the greatest danger. I believe that the moment I turn liberty into license, I grieve the Holy Spirit. I believe that the Spirit will do nothing to deliver me without my cooperation. God will not do anything. No covenant promise can be given you without your cooperation and mine. He will not. The Holy Ghost will do nothing. No promise. Nothing of any covenant. If we are not going to cooperate with the voice of the Holy Spirit, if we're not cooperate with what He speaks, I believe the Spirit, I believe that I am tempting the mercy of Christ when I look the second, third time and then shake off conviction. Now, now Paul was not wanting to bring the church under any kind of condemnation. He didn't want people to go around walking in fear of falling into fornication or any other sin. And he gives a wonderful promise, verse 13. Look at it, if you will, please. Verse 13, chapter 10. There hath no temptation taken you but such is common to man. Now, what what temptation are we talking about? Now, in the context, I believe it has to deal with the sin of murmuring and complaining. Because he he says in uh, verse 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Look at me, please. This is the temptation that, that Paul goes on to say is common to all of us. You see, we, we read this, it says that no temptation taking you such as common to man. In, in other words, some people get that. God's saying, well, well everybody does it. Everybody. Yes, he's, he's saying it more emphatically. Saying, everybody is guilty of it. This temptation to doubt God. This temptation to disbelieve in the miracle power of God. This tendency, this, this temptation... That comes on us when we face a trial, this temptation that we are tempted with, these thoughts that keep pounding in our minds, is God able or why God? Again, why do you let me go through this again and again? As the children of Israel faced one problem after another, ten times provoking God. He said, But God's faithful who will not permit you or suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And I've always been bothered by that, that you may escape. Well, if you escape, why do you have to bear it? It's gone. But you see, stay to the context and you will understand what Paul the Apostle is saying to the church of Jesus Christ. He said there's a temptation that we're all... It's common to all of us, every believer, this temptation to doubt the faithfulness of God. 
He said it's common to all of us. But he said God is faithful. Now, here's the point. And this is where I'm going to close in just a few moments. You see, the history, history shows that the enemy brought ruin to the paradise that God had established here on earth. Gates are closed. Adam and Eve are disqualified. Adam and Eve fall into unbelief. You follow down in history and you see Israel, Satan is successful in bringing down a whole generation of believers because of unbelief. Now we come to the last days. And now, this is, this is the way of escape. So that there will be a generation in the last day before Jesus comes who will not doubt him, who will be brought into a rest. And that rest is simply this. I believe that I can live my life without fear, without doubt, with unbelief. I believe it's possible because this is not the house of Moses now. This is the house of Christ that he is building. This is his house. And he is sent to this earth to bring a body into the rest. To believe the Heavenly Father will see them through. The Heavenly Father will be faithful to his promises. That the Heavenly Father will not do anything that would harm his children. And he's going to have a people in the last day. He said, I am going to make a way of escape in the last day. That you may be able to endure anything at any time. That you may be able to endure it. He is not going to take us out of the suffering. Often. He's not going to take us away when the country is in economic chaos. We're all going to be in the chaos. But he said, I'm going to have a people that is in rest. He said, I will not permit this last generation. I'm not going to allow the devil to take this last generation. I'll have a people that have come into the rest. There remains the rest of the children of God. And I've asked God to bring me into that rest because he created me a free moral agent. If I don't have the ability through the Holy Ghost to trust God, then I'm not a free moral agent. I'm a robot and God is unjust. God has given me the ability and the power to believe. And I can bring every thought into captivity, the obedience of Jesus Christ. And I can look the devil in the eye. And I can look society in the eye. And I can say, let nature run its course. Let it go wild. Let everything collapse and be shaken. We have a God that's going to see us through in the last day. We are going to enter into that rest. Hallelujah. My prayers, oh God, this is what your covenant is all about. To bring a people into total rest and confidence that can look every storm in the eye. Say, devil, do what you want to do. But I know one thing. I've got a wall of fire around about me. I've got a God in heaven. I've got a high priest in glory. Hallelujah. Folks. God hates, abhors, despises unbelief. And we don't take seriously our murmuring and complaining. But, oh, God's been dealing with my heart not to murmur about anything, to begin to thank Him in all things He said, to give Him thanks, to give Him praise, to get up in the morning and, and, and you know, so all my back, my my neck, my arms, oh God, am I ever going to be free of pain? So, oh God, thank you that you're alive today, you're well. Oh God, what am I going to do if things get bad? Looking unto Jesus, Paul said, the author 
the finisher. He said, I'm going to finish this job by start. I'm going to take you through. Will you stand? May God make this a believing church. Believing for the impossible. Folks, I'll tell you what God has in store. He has in store for this city a shaking, a convicting, a moving. And if we'll seek God and believe Him, that nothing is impossible. Aren't you tired of sitting by and watching homosexuals take power? Aren't you a little weary of them now trying to get God's name off our coins and from the pledge of the flag and just absolutely cast God's name in vain in the mire? Remember what we've been preaching. God said, I'm going to rise and I'm going to defend my own name. But folks, when, when Daniel heard what God intended to do, he fell on his face and began to intercede and pray. And we've been given a word that God's going to stand in the city and in the country and defend his own name now. He's going to move in judging power and mighty power. And if we obey him and believe him, what, what we really need is another theater jam-packed with newborn souls, newborn saints, a whole other church, the same church, but another whole theater somewhere just filled with people. And we need to see pastors in our prayer meetings coming under the same uh, burden of the Lord. It's time to believe. God, forgive our unbelief. Lord, forgive our unbelief. Forgive my unbelief. God, we're going to have to start believing you for great, miraculous things. We're going to have to believe for our own lives. A daily provision and whatever comes, Lord, that telephone call, that word from the doctor, whatever it may be. Oh, God, we can cast ourselves on you. Say, live or die, I'm the Lord's. God will do what is right. Heavenly Father, can we say truthfully, we trust you. We believe you. I'm going to open the altars for those who have to confess. Now, you may be in the annex. I'm speaking to you and here in the auditorium upstairs and down. You, you have been, I put it straight, murmuring and complaining. And there's been some unbelief that's gotten a hold of your heart. And you've been asking God why and you've been wondering. I'm going to ask you, if the Holy Spirit's speaking, you get out of your seat. And I want you to confess the sin of unbelief. I want you to confess it. I want you to say, Lord, I have, I have not trusted you in, these, in this particular time of my life, in my crisis. I've not been trusting you. I have fear and doubt. And in the annex, you go to the lobby, and the ushers will show you how to get into this room. You come down here and meet me here, and we'll pray with you. And believe God to deliver you and pluck every root of unbelief. Up in the balcony, go the stairs on either side and come down. Uh, if you're not right with God, if you're here today, you say, Pastor Dave, I, I really don't even know Jesus in a personal way. I, I've never received him as my Lord you get out of your seat and the Holy Spirit's talking to you. Come and follow these that are coming. Just get out of your seat and follow these that are honest enough to come and say, I have this unbelief in me and I want God to pluck it out of my heart. And if you've been running from God, you've been backslidden, you've grown cold toward the Lord, and you feel that tug and pull of the Holy Spirit, you obey Him also. I'm not going to prolong this. It doesn't take God a long time to accomplish the work when your heart is open. I can't tell you how seriously God's been dealing with me on this. As you know, our family's faced a lot of problems like, like your family. A lot of crises. A lot of sickness and illness and things like that. But through it all, God's been teaching our family to trust Him. 
And he wants a trusting people. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust him about your finances, your relationships. Everything has to do with your job, your family, your health, everything. He doesn't want you to leave one area open to the spirit of unbelief. And this is a step of, that you can take. You can choose to believe God. If you are a child of God, if you, if you have been touched by the Spirit of God, your heart, the Holy Spirit abides in you. And Christ is your Lord. You have a renewed will. You, you are able. You have the power and the will. If you just take advantage of just do it in His name. In Jesus' name. I choose to believe. In Jesus' name, I choose to cast down my unbelief. In the name of Jesus, I ask the Holy Spirit to remind me of every doubt and fear that enters my mind. I take authority over it. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over those doubts and fears. And I'm going to say, God will never fail me. God will not fail me. I want you to pray this prayer out loud and clear. Lord Jesus, forgive my unbelief. Forgive my doubts. Forgive my fears. Now, in the name of Jesus, I give my heart, my sins, my unbelief to the blood of Jesus Christ. And I receive by faith forgiveness. And Lord, I will believe you. I choose to believe you. I choose to have faith. Because I've been promised that I've been given a new mind and a new heart by believing in your salvation. Now I give him thanks. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you thanks. Lord, we give you thanks. Hallelujah. Lord, we believe. The Lord just put one last thing in my heart. I want to pray a prayer of faith for everyone in the annex and upstairs, downstairs, wherever you're at, wherever you're hearing me now. I I want to pray a prayer of faith for healing. We're going to trust God. Let's trust Him right now for your healing. Let's trust God right now. You don't have to wait till this afternoon for healing line. He can do it now. He can do it in the annex. He can fill that room with the glory as He has in the presence of God. He wants to, how many need a healing in your body? Raise your hand now and keep it high. Just keep it there right now and let's pray and let's believe God right now. Will you believe God? God is able. I'm believing God for the healing of my wife's bladder. I'm believing God's healing for her leg. That there be no operation necessary. I don't know what you're believing about, but let's believe God now. You believe God right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, these words don't fall in front of my face. These are not the ramblings of a pastor. This is your living word. This is your word to us. This is your promise. And we stand upon your promise. We come to an almighty God who gave us a Savior and a high priest. And we come to you, Jesus, our high priest. We come to the blood, not only of cleansing, but the blood of healing. I ask you to heal, Lord, all through this building. We bring down the powers of the enemy. Our weapons are mighty through God in pulling down these strongholds. Let a spirit of faith rise in this church. Let faith arise. Let faith arise in the name of Jesus. Give him thanks. Give him thanks. This is the conclusion of the message.